Thank you, thank you, Andreas, for inviting me, and thank you, Paul, all the organizers, for inviting me. So, this is the general outline of this talk. So, I uh, will first try to, uh, to present, uh, to give some view of an action and prediction centric view of cognition, which is a bit different from the more traditional frameworks cognition. Then I will, uh, of course, cognition is a huge topic. <coughs> uh, I will focus a little bit on social cognition and social context. Then I will try to draw some general conclusions about this. So let's start. Uh, everybody, everybody knows the traditional view of cognition in a sense, which is uh, something that Andreas uh, has already attacked today. So uh, it's easy for me to recapitulate these arguments. In a sense, you have a single flow from perception to cognition and action. <coughs> And uh, in a sense, you first perceive the external world, then you transform it into some internal code, which is completely different from perception and action. And then you, you hope to get back to action, but actually it could not work so well in practice. So it could be that this doesn't really work uh, for real brains, but also for artificial systems. Well, uh, whereas I think that uh, we should start from the idea that the brain is really for uh, real-time adaptive action and decisions in the real world. So it cannot really be uh, completely stimulus-driven. And uh, there are a few frameworks now in neuroscience, in uh, cognitive psychology, that try to go in this direction. One is this affordance competition hypothesis of Chizek and Kalaska. What they say basically is that the whole job of the brain is uh, specifying uh, and selecting among concurrent actions in parallel. Because that, that, that's what the environment offers you. You, you have to, to quickly uh, uh, grab the affordances in the, of the environment, and then all the cognitive processing is organized in a loop that helps you specifying and selecting actions. Uh, that's a, that framework really puts the action at the center of cognition. There are a few other frameworks which are very interesting to me, because to me, uh, a, a twin of action is a prediction. In sense. So one framework that puts prediction uh, as its center is this active inference, free energy, or a predictive coding view, or, which is now very made very popular by Carl Friston, uh, but of course there are many other works. So I in this kind of framework, uh, it is not really the stimulus that starts cognition, it's an internal prediction that starts the loop. So, so the stimulus is really used to say if predictions are correct or not, and to help you get your goals. Uh, a related framework that really emphasizes <laughs> prediction, but in a more uh, action-based approach, is this framework that I've called the forward modeling framework. I don't know if there is a specific name, but you will see this, uh, this picture later on in the presentation uh, again. So this is a standard control theoretic loop in which you have a goal and uh, you have a decided state that you want to achieve and you have some controllers which just transform your perception into movement. Uh, but at the same time, you have some predictors that tells you continuously <coughs> what uh, are your expectations about the sensory consequences of your action. And that turns out to be a key component of many uh, perceptual cognitive abilities that uh, we will look at, the perception and action part. So uh, to recapitulate here, uh, the idea of these frameworks compared to the traditional view of cognition is that brain processing is organized to specify and select actions. It is dominated really by internal processes, not by stimuli. So by internal motivation, predictions, goals, and processes they prepare to act. And that's really dominating. We sh I think that we should really try to look at the brain in this way, uh, not, not only as a series of transformation from stimulus to, to responses. In a sense, uh, for robotics, that's a bit more natural, because we, we have this robot. We want the robot to do something in the external world. So you start from very simple forms of an intelligence from uh, uh, interaction with the external world. And uh, so uh, doing complex things is very hard, but even doing the simple things is, uh, is hard. But to me, this gives to robotics a, 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 let's say, good platform for thinking about cognition. Because also d during development, cognition started uh, as an, an overt engagement with the environment. And then all the higher level capabilities were built on top of these primitive architectures for control. Of, uh, of very simple sensory motor situations. So this is why uh, there is this loop here. So in a sense, uh, in this action and prediction centric view of cognition, you start with sensory motor interactions and predictions, and then in turn, this scopes your cognitive processes. This really creates the perception and the cognition inside you. I, I think this resonates very much with uh, the uh, ESMC uh, project, in a sense, because the, the, the whole idea is to have the action uh, start uh, bootstrapping the cognition the perception and the cognition. Uh, 
I will give you a, a few examples of this. For instance, the brain really uses knowledge of action and their consequences to, s uh, to create the peripersonal space. So if you think of space in computer science, typically the space state is pre pre specified by hand, by programmers. But in the real brain, that, the real brain doesn't work in that way. So having the space is something that, that is built and is built for allowing for intelligent or adaptive action. So this is a very uh, famous picture by, Grazia, by the, the group of Graziano. And so the point uh, of this picture is that, well, uh, what you see in this picture is, is that there are neurons in the ventral interior part area uh, that respond to visual, to tactile and audi auditory stimuli. And uh, so the point is that you have a, a few fields here around you that you create. So in a sense, you shape the space around you as a, a, a space in which you integrate information in a very relevant way. Why this? The, the point is that this space is not just an abstract Cartesian space, but it's really the space that you can reach, the space from which you can be really attacked. So the, also the space around you is something that is behaviorally relevant. It's not something that you just have, just encode in some coordinates and don't care. So uh, what they suggest is that, uh, the, the, well, what the, the monkey does in this case, but also the human does in this case, is creating a, an a, a representation, an external representation of the peripersonal space. And what happens in the peripersonal space is behaviorally relevant. So any event touch. Uh, lights that happen in this peripersonal space are immediately meaningful for the agent, or for, for the monkey and the human in this case. Uh, this space is, uh, of course, during you learn this kind of uh, space representation, this perceptual representation during your development. This is, uh, this is uh, however, not fixed, because when you, learn, when you learn using new tools, then this uh, peripersonal space can really extend with the tool. So what does it mean? It means that in reality the space representation or the perceptual representation is not something completely uh, agnostic relative to the action that you want to do. It's really driven by the action you want to do in this space. So again, to talk in terms of the SMC project, it is the action that really shapes the perception in this case. But you an alternative would be just a statistical bias, that the, the, the learning mechanism itself is sort of just unbiased and it sucks in all the statistics that they tell us in the world. But mm. now the action is just perturbing these statistics and you, you, just, you zoom in on it, zoom in on it. So it's not specifically to, to the tool use. It's just another deformation of the statistics, the possible statistics that you can encounter. Uh, yes, but uh, well, it depends on what you consider an action because then, then even if you don't move the, the, the tool here, you, you are so it's uh, in a sense it's a projected space, so the, the projected space of your action possibilities that is perturbing, that is changing the, the representation. So if you consider action in that way, which is which I like very much, that's uh, I, com I completely agree with you. But in any case, this means that you, you really change your perceptual representations, uh, your uh, or your space, uh, depending on what you can do with your actions. And uh, I was just suggesting that exactly your architecture. Uh, has this capability in a sense. The truth. Sorry? Ah, the truth. Okay, sorry. Uh, so your, uh, the, the, the DAC architecture that I'm pretty sure you know very well now uh, does exactly the same thing in the adaptive layer because the adaptive layer is not something which is pre-coded but it's something which is built uh, by interacting with the external world. So uh, this could be also a suggestion for an exercise in a sense. So I just use the, the DAC architecture to develop uh, some uh, a, a good peripersonal space, depending on the action possibilities, and then change this body schema depending on new abilities or new actions that the robot acquires, which should uh, work in practice with your architecture. Okay, uh, uh, something different now. So the brain uh, does not only use the action representation to shape the space, but also for building a representation of objects in the external world in terms of affordances. So again, the external world is not something which is simply encoded, but it's something that has to be uh, conceptualized in a behaviorally relevant way. And this is exactly the meaning of the term affordances. So the external world uh, offers you possibilities for action. And the brain uh, uses the motor system to encode automatically this possibility for action, such that when the, uh, there is a visual simulation of an object, then the motor system uh, really resonates with it. In a sense, it could be a motor preparation or it could be, uh, let's say, the acknowledgement that there is some affordances in the environment. 
But this is, uh, uh, again, a, a single cell uh, study by the Parma group, uh, quite an old one. Uh, it, it's the famous canonical neurons stuff. So the point is that here they have registered one single neuron uh, when the monkey was grasping or simply seeing uh, different objects, a plate, a cube, a cone. As you can see here, it, it, uh, this specific neuron uh, is uh, very active when there is a ring, whether the ring is grasped or is simply seen. So in a sense, this is a, a visual motor neuron that uh, when the ring is, is, uh, is uh, in the face, of, when the, the monkey is in the face of a ring, it really, its motor system really encodes this possibility for action, this possibility for grasping the ring with exactly the same uh, motor processes that it uses for grasping it in practice. There are many, many other demonstrations. Uh, this is a human study by Shao and Martin that tells that uh, premotor areas and parietal areas really respond to tools very actively. So why should uh, a, mo a motor areas in the traditional sense of cognition uh, should be involved in looking at uh, hammers or other objects? So the point again is that uh, many people uh, have suggest that this is because you, the brain directly tries to encode the external world in terms of action possibilities. Uh, and of course, um, if you see it in a developmental perspective, so the action, you, you use actively the actions to make sense of the external world. We have seen a great lecture uh, before my own. So in a sense, you, you are not, not just passive, of course, you, are, you use your action to explore the external world and to build increasingly good representation of what are the affordances of the environment to develop increasingly more complex skills here. So this is a developmental process. Something more complex now, so not only the brain uh, is shaped by action during learning and development, but uh, I think that the action system is very active also during uh, uh, the overt engagement with the external world. It can really do uh, hard things, so the brain can really use the knowledge of how the body interacts with the world, what action, fo uh, world, what prediction follow, what action, to do very complex forms of problem solving, which I call an embodied problem solving. Now I'll show you the video, because it, uh, you can really if it works, I'll show you the video. Let's see. Okay, now it works. So now, little explanation now. So this guy here uh, is a climber. Actually, he's a, has been five, five times a world champion. And what he is doing now is uh, just looking at a, a climbing wall with a climbing problem prior to a competition. That's a World Cup competition. And uh, what he is doing now is looking at this wall for the first time. This climbing wall is plenty of climbing holes everywhere. And because he is looking at this, uh, this climbing wall for the first time, he is trying to figure out how to climb it in, uh, in a few minutes. And uh, that's very important because w when you are climbing, you, you cannot really change too much your, your plans. So in a sense, the ability to also anticipate, to read the problem, to solve this little problem, they are hard problems, they are not so simple. Those abilities are very crucial to the, to the ability to win. And as you can see, he really mimics or simulates the action that he will do uh, with those holes. I call it embodied problem solving because as you see, he is really using the knowledge of his uh, body, also a little bit of help by the real movements to figure out what to do. And uh, probably, well, the quality of the video is very poor, but anyway, I think that uh, th that's really a prototypical case of uh, uh, reuse of the, your action knowledge for doing more complex cognitive operation. And you will see in a moment that the, the problem this guy is trying to solve is not so simple. So uh, you can barely see the climbing holes, but uh, I can say they are very small and placed in a very strange way, if you see. So, so if, if you look at how this guy is climbing this wall, Probably it's hard to notice, but the, the movements that he di did before were very useful to really plan these quite strange, uh, quite strange movements. Okay, not so bad. Okay, now he's trying to get the top. So if you get the top, typically you're ranking high. Okay, close to the end. Well, it doesn't, doesn't work every time. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work, but th for this guy, it has worked many, many times. Anyway, th the point I wanted to make is that really this action knowledge can be used for very complex things. And uh, this is just a fun uh, parallel. 
So I really think that uh, thinking, this is not the topic of this talk, but I really think that thinking is really some, something very, very like the overt action, but it is an internalized process. So in a sense, this, uh, this patient here was, uh, with, uh, unfortunately, with bi uh, bilateral parietal lesions, was unable to refrain from executing imagined hand movements and was unaware of these movements. So also this climber here was uh, unable to refrain from executing movements. So this is the joke, but the, 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 the argument is that it could be that the, the actions uh, and uh, the way you think your actions and the way you execute your actions, they are closely related in terms of uh, brain substrate, in terms of processes, but also in terms of use, because then thinking can be really uh, mentally constructing the plan for action uh, with the very same resources that you use to act in practice. So Giovanni, would you say that uh, in quite literal sense, gesture is part of well, uh, in this Italy, specific, yeah. <laughs> in Italy, <laughs> absolutely. Of course, in Italy, more than Well, seriously asking. I mean, if yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, absolutely. From what you say. Well, I, in a sense, and it's not just expressing. No, 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 absolutely. It really helps thinking. Yeah, it scaffolds your thinking. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, the, the, well, in the in the literature of situated cognition, there are many, many demonstrations. Such <laughs> as, for instance, people playing a Tetris game, they typically rotate to better, uh, well, well, they do not mentally rotate. Sometimes they mentally rotate, but sometimes they really use their actions to help their cognitive processing. Because when you rotate, you can perceptually match very quickly. So it, even in this case, w when, you, when you move your yeah, hand. Is this a study that someone compared all of that? So you had users? The Tetris? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. There's a very famous stu study in 94 by Kirsch and Mayo. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're not Kirsch. reading enough? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, nobody knows everything. You, you know the truth because you know the duck. Right? Exactly. <laughs> no, but uh, to, to be more serious, here you are. To me, you are really using your body as a support, as a scaffold for cognition, because the posture you have not only helps you to get in the right proprioception, but may maybe also helps you measuring things. And uh, but then you could still argue it's a specialized problem. It's a motor problem, so you're gesturing to sort of rehearse a bit the, the movements you have to execute, and I think. Are you going to convince us that this is just more like an echo of a core cognitive process as opposed to a specialized motor process? Well, uh, I, I think I will convince you with the next study, okay. which is exactly about climbers. So uh, does this climbing e expertise really matter in practice? So we conducted a memory task with climbers. And uh, he, here you can see more or less the same phenomenon, people just during the phase of a climbing wall. So what we did is comparing two groups uh, a group of expert climbers and a group of novice climbers, they, what they had to do is just looking at uh, three different climbing routes, okay? An easy route, a difficult route, and an impossible route, so a non-climbable route. This is not actually a route, it's just random, uh, random uh, holes in the wall. So the, the wall was very huge with many, many holes, and uh, we uh, have shown to these people uh, just one, just two times uh, the holes that belong uh, to the three sequences, the easy route, the difficult route, and the impossible route. They had to recall. So what we found is that, uh, uh, just to remember you, there were two groups, experts and novices. So the experts had no advantages in the easy route, because also the novices that were able to climb the easy route were able to recall it, not only to climb it, but to recall. The experiment is not about climbing, we just ask them to recall them, but the easy route is something that, in theory, the, uh, the novices were able to climb. Whereas only the experts were able to climb the difficult route. And they had also a very big difference in terms of uh, uh, how, how good they memorized this route. So this is not a perceptual effect, we controlled for this, so the, we, we matched many, many perceptual parameters. So it's really the skill that matters here. And this advantage disappears if this, the route is n cannot be climbed. So if it's just, uh, uh, some, just some random uh, climbing holes. Uh, there is, of course, a famous experiment about chess play, which is similar because chess experts they also have these big advantages. You remember chess positions that are valid given the, the rules of the game. In this case, is, uh, is uh, really a memory study which, however, taps your motor knowledge, your motor competence. It's quite specific of your motor competence. So, uh, in, in a sense, what we think is that really seeing the climbing walls activates this motor simulation. And uh, of course, we are in Italy, so we tend to move a lot the arms. But I can uh, assure you that with uh, the paper, and uh, uh, they, weren't, they were not so able to move the arms. So it was a 
almost uh, everything was almost covered. And, uh, but this simulation does not rely only on perceptual aspects of the climbing wall, but really on the motor competence. And, uh, and this, this ability, not, not only this ability is modulated by the motor competence, but it also really affects recall in a specific way. So in this case, I would say that this kind of knowledge is not just a leakage of a cognition into action, it is really effective. That's at least our interpretation. Okay, now uh, uh, another demonstration that the, the, the brain uses the knowledge of action, so the action system for quite complex things. So that, that's a, a very nice and interesting paper. Well, it's, there is a lot of speculation, but the point is that the motor system and the predictive system, they are really the key to understand, uh, to understand the awareness and the sense of agency. Uh, so we have already seen this picture here. You have a, a, a goal, you have a desired state, a controller, and a predictor. And what Fritz, uh, Chris Fritz and others propose is that impairments in this uh, circuit here can produce many kinds of dysfunction, or dysfunctionalities and uh, abnormalities. So if, if you destroy the controller, of course, you are not able uh, to execute the action. But for instance, if you destroy, in a subtle way, just the ability to compare uh, the predictive state with, uh, with the actual state. So if you destroy just the predictor, what they say is that that leads to a, a, a form of schizophrenia, which is a delusion of control in this case. So the patient is really able to formulate an intention, specifies a movement, and then it, he also sees it realized in practice, but because he cannot have this, uh, uh, this internal loop in which he predicts the consequences, because this loop is impaired, he does not attribute the action to himself. Unfortunately, this, uh, this kind of delusional control exists in practice, so people uh, can be convinced that they formulate an intention and they see the hand moving, but they are not the author of these movements. So in this interpretation, uh, they, so they, the system is able to do the action, but it's not able to anticipate its consequences. And because the circuit is broken, you cannot, really, uh, you cannot really make sense of the whole, of the whole thing. And this is why you do not attribute to yourself the action. You would think that there is an alien uh, taking control of your thoughts and executing the action. OK, but now uh, I want to talk a little bit more how, uh, how the brain uses knowledge of action in, uh, for action understanding in the social context. Uh, we have seen many demonstrations in the individual context, in reasoning, uh, in sense of agency, but in the social context also. That, that's uh, a bit of the second part of my talk. Uh, because the social world is very complex in a sense, uh, very, very complex. And how does the predictive brain help in social context? So let's start from the simplest thing, maybe, well, simplest, I don't know, but from a quite simple thing, which is action observation. So we all know from the literature that when we observe actions executed by others, there are circuits in our brain, in, in the motor brain, uh, circuits that are very active. They are the famous mirror neurons, for instance, uh, which uh, are really active, which were originally found in the uh, premotor cortex of monkeys. Now there is a, a huge literature on this. But anyway, there are certain parts of your brain that are typically used to execute actions, but they also respond when other people, uh, where conspecifics typically execute actions, more or less in your very personal space, so in a behaviorally relevant sense. Um, so uh, again, the brain is using motor circuits to encode actions executed by others. There are many, many other nice demonstrations. One is this study by Calvo Merino with dancers, again with uh, novices and expert dancers. And they have uh, discovered that this, uh, this uh, resonance mechanism is much stronger when you are, uh, you are an expert dancer observing the kind of dance that you can do. So the more the, your motor system is able to reproduce the action, the more it seems to be automatically engaged in this, uh, in this kind of resonance. Uh, of course, the, the, from the original uh, studies of action understanding in, in, uh, in motor brain areas, now there have been many studies, uh, and the conclusion is that the action observation network is a very wide uh, network in the brain, which encompasses many areas, and of course there is also controversy about this, but. Uh, the interesting thing is that the motor areas are involved in this. And so the question is, why is the motor system involved in action perception? So wh why should it? And the hint for me is, what is the motor system good for, apart from executing actions? So this is an organic proposal, in a sense, which is called uh, action simulation by Jarreau, by many, many, many other people. 
So the point is that uh, the, act the motor system is very good at predicting the, your movements. And then it is also reused to predict the actions of the other. Then there are subtly different conceptualization of this, but more or less the action simulation in its strong uh, version is really the offline reuse of the same motor programs and internal models implied in the online controller prediction of action. So uh, here we have again this controller prediction uh, figure, which is uh, different, but it's exactly the same as before. So you have a goal, you have a controller, and in parallel a predictor, and you have the environment. So uh, that's normal in control theory, in a sense. So during normal action, what you do is to execute an action which affects the environment, and then the environment gi gives you some feedback. But in parallel in this kind of architecture, you also generate predictions in synchro with actions. And these predictions help you, for instance, uh, 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 dealing with the noise in the measurements or give you better abilities to estimate the state. That, that's all in control theory. But the, how could the actions, how could this, uh, this network be reused in a sense? So the proposal of Jean Roy of many other people is that it's exactly the same circuit, but you just inhibit the inputs and the outputs. So this means that the blue loop cannot really work, but the internal loop can work. That's a bit simplistic, of course. It's very simplistic, but just to give you an idea. So the idea is that you really reuse the, the, the sensory motor circuit that you use to act, and you use it also to simulate actions. In this case, the simulation of action, which can be used for thinking, for prospection, for many things. In this case, I will discuss its use in the observation of actions executed by others. Uh, let's go. Let's see if there is some uh, di direct evidence, causal evidence of this. I think this is a very beautiful study by the group of uh, Salvador Aliot in Rome. And uh, so what they did is again a study with uh, expert and novice, but in this case is uh, basket basketball players. Basketball players. Uh, so th they were shooting, and uh, they had uh, three groups. But now we just look at two groups: motor experts. So they were uh, es expert basketball players, and the visual experts. So people that. Uh, like coaches or other people who are, who are uh, more or less have the same skill in the perceptual part, but not in the motor part, and that's key to this study. So what they found, the first result is that, uh, well, the task was simply uh, looking at some videos a different, uh, that were stopped at a different length, and they just asked to, to these people to predict whether the, the, the it will be a hit or a miss. So th th that's very simple. And, uh, well, what they found, the first result, is that motor experts are better than visual experts in predicting. That's okay. But the second part is more interesting, because they also applied uh, TMS to evoke some uh, motor potentials. Uh, and uh, so, so to, to say it very simply, what they did is measuring the, uh, measuring the activation of a muscle in the hand, which is highly predictive of the kind of, of, the kind of, of uh, launch that this, uh, that this uh, player will do uh, at a specific point in time. So here, this muscle is not very predictive, but here, it is really this muscle that tells you if the hit will be, if the launch will be a hit or a miss. So what they found is that uh, in synchro with, uh, with the informativeness of this, uh, uh, well, uh, of this muscle, uh, the athletes had very high uh, motor evoked potentials in this muscle, so suggesting that they were really using or querying the muscular, actually the muscular system, not only the action system, at a very deep level, just asking uh, to, to generate some prediction probably, uh, and to help predicting if it is a, a valid trajectory or not. What they suggest is that, the, well, they call it an anticipatory resonance mechanism, uh, which induce elite athletes' brains with the ability to predict others' action ahead of their realization. What is beautiful to me uh, in this study is that it's really the motor component that helps. It's not only that motor experts are better in predicting. Now, can you explain what you what, what this could exactly mean with resonance mechanisms? Well, uh, I personally do not agree with this uh, term here, because to me, the, 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 the resonance, well, the, the term, the, the solution, a lot of confusion in the dictionary. The term resonance was originally uh, discussed in the context of mirror neurons. So the point is that it's just an automatic activation of your own uh, motor system when uh, you see another person using exactly the same part of the motor system for grasping or for, uh, for throwing or for whatever. So that's just an automatic resonance mechanism. That's the it's meaning. It's used in some metaphorical way. It's yes. Right, so it's not, it's not pervasive in the literature. It used 
by a subset. It's used by well, it was used during the, the many for many many years in the mirror neuron papers. Mm -hmm. So this resonance for, uh, has been well. I, I don't really like the term resonance, but it, it was. No, used but for your story, it doesn't matter. You don't no, absolutely not. No, no. It's just that. So my story is slightly different. My story is that what you are doing is really uh, querying your motor system at a very deep level to generate you some to generate some prediction. This prediction helps you looking at. Uh, so interpreting what you see perceptually and helps you making predictions. So that's my story. It's a bit different. It's not automatic resonance. It's really something much more active to me, which could be automatic in the sense that it is not, in, not deliberate, not conscious, but that's, of course, a different story. So this is one, uh, one, one way to look at this. Uh, we start again from this architecture with controllers and predictions and predictors. But now uh, what happens here is that this girl here is trying to figure out what this guy here is doing. And he has many hypotheses. Uh, each controller, let's say he, she has four controllers. So her hypotheses are about four possible actions. Each controller, which can execute this pole, this pole balancing action, uh, is coupled to a predictor. And uh, the process is, is very simple. So during uh, observation, uh, she gets, uh, so she generates many, many predictions relative to the different actions that this guy could, be, could do in practice. A few of them are discarded very easily because uh, is it a kicking action? No, because the prediction error is very big. So uh, is this a, 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 let's say a throwing action? No, because the prediction error is very bad. So it could be that it is a sequence of actions that then this system is able to recognize in time. So uh, here, this system is used not to generate action, but to interpret or to understand the action that were uh, observed. There are many, many other systems that do things in similar ways. So by the Midis, for instance, uh, by many other people do things in a similar way. Now I'll show you an implementation of this idea uh, that we did. Well, I in this video here, you see, you see a hand, uh, we'll enter this scene very Quickly, okay, you see this hand now. Okay, now the task is uh, for, for the system. The system looks at this hand from the top. Uh, and, uh, and the task is to recognize if it's doing ac action one, two, or three. So grasping one, two, or three, or stopping, or coming back. So it can really recognize five actions, more or less with the same computational schema that we have seen before. So you have five controllers that are also trying to uh, couple two predictors that are generating prediction of what will happen next. So in this case, you see that, OK, now this hand is going in this direction. In one direction, OK, here you can see that there is a bit of confusion. Well, each uh, blob, blob of uh, colors here, uh, well, this algorithm is called a particle filter. So it's, it's each blob is just a, a composite of particles. And the different colors are relative to the five different hypotheses. So you should see here five blobs for the different hypotheses. And the, the blobs that survive are also the hypotheses that survive. So it's a statistical technique that make only the best hypothesis survive. OK, so in this case, let's see something more, simple, more evident here. OK, in this case, you can really see that at this specific point in time, the system, the observing system, has two very strong hypotheses here which are surviving. Maybe it could be this one, or it could be this one. If you read here the probability distribution, well, Actually, this one is already winning uh, as well. But in a sense, this is a probabilistic uh, algorithm in which uh, you generate uh, perceptual hypotheses. I will show you in details in a moment how, we, how this works. But it generates perceptual hypotheses uh, relative to the different competitor actions. Then you test uh, these hypotheses and generate prediction errors. And those prediction errors help you refine your hypothesis. So OK. You can see, as you can see, in some phases, the hypotheses are very scattered. In some other phases, they are uh, very clear. And uh, so this is more or less what it does. OK, and uh, probably this was not so evident, but this is a faint in a sense. So here we are faint in the system. So one hypothesis is very strong, but after a while, it changes. And then the blue hypothesis disappears, and the green hypothesis then wins. So the system, of course, uh, cannot really rule out, rule out all the other actions because you can see a faint. So it should maintain a probability distribution over the, all the possible actions, almost. 
how does it work in practice here? So I don't want to annoy you with uh, details. Maybe you ask me the details, but this is a, a Bayesian networks basically, and uh, think of these uh, circles here as uh, uh, populations of neurons enco encoding probability distributions over something. For instance, here in this index here, you have a probability distribution over the three possible actions that you will see: one, two, and three. So this is ju just index. So let's imagine this is the firing rate of a neural population. We don't use neural population here, but the, the mathematics is equivalent in a sense. And the same here uh, for motor commands. The, and the here is the state representation. Here is the observation. Here it doesn't matter now. So this red part here is what I call the, the controller. What, what the controller does is simply producing some motor commands, such as uh, going in this direction, the other direction, depending on the state of the environment and the intention, in a sense, the action I want to reach. Okay. So what the system does is uh, generating some hypothesis based on the possible controllers, and these are particles here. Then for each controller, you have a couple predictor, which is the blue part, which simply says, OK, if I'm generating this motor command, then I will see the arm in that position in a moment. And then from this set of particles, you see there are other sets of particles which are relative to the predictions, uh, that uh, the prediction relative to the sensory consequences that will be generated if an action is put into practice. But this system now is not, using, is not used for acting, but for recognizing the actions. So now let's imagine the system is just generating a priori some hypothesis of what the other guy could be doing now. And then it receives uh, uh, an observation, the Z here, which is a noisy observation. So it could be that the arm is more or less in this direction. And I recall you that there are only three hypotheses now, so this problem is quite simple. So if it gets this prediction, uh, th this observation here, it can also uh, generate a prediction error. So the prediction error for the red and blue hypothesis is very big. Whereas for the yellow one, not so big. So what happens in the next step is that the yellow, the number of yellow particles increases. And here, the probability encoded by, in this case, by the system that the right action is the yellow action or the going towards the tree is increasing. And this scheme is iterated in time. And then uh, the action is uh, recognized with some confidence, with uh, some confidence. Uh, we did also uh, a few human experiments. I'll show you only one. But in this case, we, we asked it to people uh, to, recognize, uh, to recognize actions from short videos, more or less in the same way of the basketball player. So we, we have shown some truncated videos. And we asked it to people when they were really confident uh, that uh, the action was uh, going towards grasping one, two, or three. And uh, the, the green one is the confidence of, uh, well, the confidence of the human, whereas the red one is the confidence of the system uh, in the same action, more or less they recognize in the same period of time. Uh, the humans, they are more uh, drastic in a sense because they just ask them to be categorical. They, we, we just ask, say yes when you recognize it. So mm, it cannot really be gradual. Whereas uh, in the system, we can read the probability distribution changing over time, so the curve is more is smoother. But then the action simulation network doesn't work uh, just before you go further, so what I don't really understand in all this explication is well, what it has to do with motor action. In the end, it's just uh, position estimation, what the, what the system is doing as well as what the, what, the, what the subjects are doing. So in how far do you see that, for example, like very subtle uh, movements of the hand are actually really important? Or so far, just the broad position of the hand is what you actually are measuring? Well, in, in this particular case, uh, the point is that the motor system, in this case, this uh, Bayesian network, is able to generate this action in, in practice, and then is, it is also mimicking or simulating the same actions to recognize the action of the other. In this specific case, the motor commands I send generate some positions of the end. So it's, it, they help estimating the position of the end. So I agree with you. But uh, in a sense, what I'm suggesting is that the brain uses knowledge of the body to help the perceptual process this case. So, uh, but at the same time, what you get is that you know the meaning and the purpose and the intention of your actions. So you know that when you generate these commands, you will grasp that object. So it is not just perceptual estimation, it's also the estimation of the goal of the action, of the intention. So that, that, that's about, that, that's a little bit more. So it's not just a, percept a perceptual task. 
It's uh, an action recognition task, uh, in included the goal of the action. And if you go uh, with more complex models that I will show later on, uh, you can also recognize uh, distal goals. So you can infer that if I'm grasping this bottle now, I will probably drink now. So I'll, you will also infer a lot of things. So one good, uh, this is a good question because <laughs> I didn't like, explain well, but involving the motor system in perceptual tasks it really helps you uh, grasping the intentions of the observed actions, not only reconstructing it, uh, it's the, the perceptual part. Well, but in the case of your model, if you would remove then this motor component, what would happen? If we would just perform the task as Armin describes it, just looking at the position, and we say, okay, we're at the top right corner, it's action one, at the bottom right corner, it's action three. Yeah, of course you can do it as a classification right. task. Yeah, but this is a, so, so the, the po my point is that uh, the brain is smart, so it uses everything. So if, because the brain has a good model of your body, so my brain has a good model of my body, so when you move, I use my model of my body to help me understand what your body, body is doing. I understand the concept, that, but that's I think Armin was, uh, was pushing you on the model in the implementation. Yeah, but. Right, and also in that implementation, you, you could have done you could just done this as a sort of position recognition task, and it would work equally well. Well, so maybe this, is, is this task or is yeah, yes and no. exercise in the concept? Yes and no, because it, it, to, to so there are of course there are many many uh, motion tracking algorithms, but if you have a good model of the process, then it helps a lot. So that's the difference between a generative model and a discriminative model. So if you have if you just want to recognize random trajectories you are much worse than when you want to recognize an intentional trajectory. Why this? My suggestion is that because your knowledge of intentional trajectory is uh, so deeply rooted into your motor system, you can execute them, and then you understand them better. This is why we compare experts with novices, because experts have increased motor skills. If your particle filter model doesn't include the notion of intention at this stage. Yeah, it, yeah, it has, because... Okay. No, it, so the point here, Probably I was a bit uh, quick on this, but uh, at this level here, you just have an index of the three actions, which can, uh, uh, with this poor model here, you can conceptualize as the three goals of the action. So grasping one, two, or three. We have also built uh, uh, more hierarchical and, uh, and hierarchical systems uh, that can also recognize distant intentions in this way, such as this is uh, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, or a beer. So my long-term intention, if I grasp a beer, could be, let's say, getting drunk. Whereas uh, if, I, uh, if I grasp uh, some coffee, I want to be uh, awake. So also from the action, we can really recognize the long-term intentions. Of course, you can do that in a, in a purely categorization task. But uh, the whole point of having a good model of the acting uh, system is that it helps a lot in practice. So uh, also in, uh, in, in any AI domain, if you have a good model of the so process. In this case, it is constraining the, the search space, right? People say, look, since I have the intention to either do one, two, or three, now I have three hypotheses to worry about and not everything else. Yeah, this is, this is one part. The second part is that uh, this, is, this actually incorporates a process model of what would, will happen next. So it's not just a, a bottom-up categorization, it's just a generative model that in incorporates a very strong knowledge. And for instance, this system will be completely faked by uh, kinematically impossible actions. In that case, maybe a purely perceptual system would perform better, because this one does not include kinematically impossible movements in this model. So, but uh, my suggestion in general, that's more a computational point. So when the brain has a good process model, it has to use it. And indeed, I think it does. But this would also mean that actually your predictions will actually very much be biased by the dimensions of your body because this should go something in, somehow go into your, to your model you are learning. Is there any study, or have you looked how this actually influences the prediction of your model? If you, for example, a big person look at the small person doing an action, or vice yeah. versa? Yeah, this is a good question, because uh, in, the, in the dancing study that I have shown, there is a very nice follow-up study in which uh, uh, this, uh, this action understanding mechanism was specific uh, for people being a male or a female. So, uh, so the, the, the more similar our bodies are, our kinematics are, the better I, I really use my 
my body and motor system to predict you. So uh, there should be some study also with children and adults where we have, uh, a long time ago, we planned a follow-up study for the climbers with children, never, never, we, we didn't do it. But f at least there are a few indications that really some specifics of the motor system can make the difference, exactly. But Armin is predicting if you have short climbers compared to long, tall climbers, that you also should see them. So yes, 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 absolutely. Which makes sense, actually. Which makes, uh, yeah. yeah, in climbing, that, that, that's a bit trivial, but in, a, in other, well, in, in the sense that I cannot really reach faults uh, that are, but, but uh, even in other situations, there are very subtle kinematic differences can produce prediction errors. And then, of course, the, the system, the, the, the brain can quickly adapt. So it's not completely blind, uh, but, but anyway, Okay, um, this is a, a follow-up study in which uh, we, we, really, we have really put this uh, action system into a context. Now, context can be many, many things. Now, le let's imagine here we have a, a demonstrator which is doing one or six actions, so reaching cup A or cup B. But now, let's use a little bit the, the Bayesian stuff for doing something more uh, nice. And uh, let's say that we have some prior information on, uh, on the action that will follow. So for instance, uh, let's start here. So I if I see, I don't show you the video, but if you see the demonstrator going towards uh, one of those two cups, this is more or less the, the trajectories of the six different hypotheses. So one wins, okay? But it could be that I have some information. This is uh, coffee and this is wine, and it is morning. So a priori, so I have some prior that in the morning you will grasp some coffee, not some wine. Uh, not sure uh, in this audience, but uh, should be. Uh, anyway, uh, if I have this prior, the, uh, using this uh, node here that I didn't explain before, it can be really incorporated into the system and actually changes the dynamics a lot. Then this is a, a, a different, uh, well, just a different context. Uh, let's see that this cup here and uh, this cup here, they have handles to the right. This makes uh, trajectories three and six a priori uh, more uh, likely than the other trajectory. So the system starts with a higher prior probability for these two trajectories. So that's, a, that, that's the point. And there is a nice correspondence here with what uh, Lala Craguero and other people said that in a sense the, the, the canonical and the mirror uh, neural networks, they really interact. And it's very intuitive. So if I have some knowledge of what, act what, act what objects are there, I use first my object knowledge to, to make some priors on what your action will be. At the same time, if you are doing something but I cannot see what you are reaching, by just seeing your action, I have some prior information on what, what you are grasping, depending on how you move. So in a sense, it's, there are bidirectional interaction between these networks trying to predict the action and trying to understand the object. And uh, what we need is putting all this in the same framework uh, I don't have here a video. What accounts for the dynamics of these responses? Do you like no, these are, these are not real data. These are just simulated data. No, right, but those are your simulations. Is there some noise in there? Do you yes, 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 yes. Yeah, the the dynamics are really is just a result of a noisy uh, sensory process. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yes. No, the observation are very noisy, but the prediction here is that if you have some prior information, for instance, on the affordance, and you look at the mirror system, then you get high higher prior activation of a few hypotheses, not the others. Why, why do you say near neural system? You can also say that's just a tag. That, that's just a tag. The action observation network. Let's say, let's say that the, the system that recognizes action is mimics the action observation network in the human brain. So at some point, this action observation network uh, in, uh, should incorporate a lot of information. Some of this information is provided by the motor system. Other sources of information. So with this, you could also do without relying on something like an action recognition system, because it just handle right or handle left. So that's also again a sensory. Oh yeah. Uh, object. Sorry, no, no. I, I was mentioning the, the world system here. So this part here can be conceptualized as an action recognition because it's really ah, okay. to understand your action. And this part here. Uh, well, this specific implementation is a bit simplistic. It just says that this process can read, is not, uh, well, this is an important theoretical point. This, this, this uh, process here is not encapsulated. It can really incorporate prior knowledge of different kinds. So one, one thing that we know is that it, it incorporates 
knowledge of, provided by the canonical neurons about the identity of objects. But I think that it, it also incorporates many other kinds of knowledge. Well, this is a video about uh, action sequences. For some reason. So here now, well, it's a bit hard to, to, to read here, but you have many more hypotheses, and you can have a proximal and distal action. So it could be that grasp this one to go here, or grasp to this one to go there. So by, by looking at the first part, you can also have uh, some prior information on what action will, uh, will follow, such as I'm, I'm grasping this one for drinking or for uh, uh, throwing it. Uh, doesn't work? OK. This is just to say that the system can be very easily, uh, uh, let's say, can easily incorporate distal intention, not only proximal actions. OK, let's go for this interim summary. Uh, I, I think that encoding observed actions in terms of one on, uh, one's own action helps predicting and uh, understanding. So that's the point of using the motor system in action understanding. Uh, we use uh, this particle filtering, but there are, of course, many other computational means just to, to, to say the same thing. And uh, another point here is this integration of motoric predictions generated by the motor system with contextual information, uh, which can be prior some goals, possible affordances, also other kind of contextual knowledge, such as, for instance, today is Monday, and every Monday, Monday Paul has a glass of wine. So that's a prior information, completely non motoric that I had to, okay. And uh, so I'm not suggesting that the motor system is the only part involved in action observation. I'm just observing that because the brain has to solve hard problems, whatever mean it has, it uses. So because it has so good models of the motor system, it really uses it then for acting, and, but also for understanding. But action understanding is only a very tiny part of social cognition. Well, it's just the, the beginning of social cognition. And then let's see what happens if we go from action observation to truly social brains. So why do we read the actions? Uh, we try to understand the action, the intention of other people. For instance, to help, or, but also to deceive other people. Yeah, also very young children. This is a study by Tomasello. They can really, uh, they can really understand your intention and help you. That's very nice. And uh, but we also read the, the mind of other people to imitate or to teach to other people or to learn from others or to perform joint actions. But also, of course, to engage in very complex social interactions so that can be linguistic or non-linguistic, it can be, uh, can be friendly or can be competitive or whatever. So the, there is a lot of complexity here. But then, uh, in accordance with what I was saying before, the ambition we have is starting from simple mechanisms of sensory motor control and see if they can really scale up and explain more complex cognitive phenomena. So that's a bit also the ambition of the, of the project, the, the, the ESMC project, start from sensory motor interaction and see, and see if it can really bootstrap increasingly more complex cognitive abilities on top of them. Then we look a little bit uh, the case of joint actions, because now we have been studying joint actions quite a lot. It's very interesting. In the next days, we will have a, a lecture on joint action by Luther Noblich also would be a great lecture. So I just say something about joint actions. Um, I, I'll show you a study, a kinematic study, that, uh, that, that has been done by this group, again, by the group of Salvador Aliotti in Rome. Uh, it's a very nice study in which two people here, I will show you a video in a moment, uh, they are asked to grasp a, a bottle. This is more or less a bottle. And they can, uh, they can reach it in just two parts, this part here or this part here. Okay. And then uh, in this first task, uh, this is the, the kinematics, the trajectory is generated. I will show you in a moment. But there are two tasks. One is imitative and the other is complementary. So in the first case, both are told, OK, grasp the lower part or grasp the, the top part. In the other part, in the second study, second condition complementary, one is told to grasp this one, and the other is told to grasp this one. OK, in this video here, I think it's a nice video. It's hard to see, but anyway. The OK, these this parts here, they are just uh, <coughs> two fingers 
two fingers and uh, the position of the arm. So just three points are recorded, and these are the trajectories that they do. So in this case, the, this one is reaching the top. This, uh, this is the bottom of the bottle. The bottle is not shown here. But otherwise, it's quite simple to see. So the two are uh, acting more or less in synchro because they are asked to, to touch at the same time. In, in either uh, the same part or uh, a different part. So in, I think the, this specific example is uh, reaching the complementary part. So one is reaching at the top, the other at the bottom. Okay. So what happens here, and what you, you will uh, know about in a couple of days by Günter Noblik, is that in these specific joint actions, there are a lot of interesting dynamics, so mutual predictions and mutual adjustments. And the argument is, uh, if uh, I am really using my motor system to do my action and to to predict your action, then I can also build a more complex loop in which I really adjust, uh, I, I really adjust depending on the prediction error that your action generates. You adjust to me, I adjust to you. In a sense, there are mutual prediction, mutual adjustments, and uh, that's one part of the story. But the, the part of the story that uh, uh, I want to tell you is a bit different because now in this uh, second task. Uh, the task is similar, but the roles of the two people are different. So one is the leader, the other is the follower. Only the leader knows where to reach. For instance, the leader knows that it has to reach top, and the follower doesn't know what the leaders uh, w will, uh, will do, but knows that it has to do an imitative or a complementary action. So in a sense, the leader has much more information than the follower. I cannot show you a video now because it's, uh, well, it was not so simple to see, but Trust me, that what happens is what we call uh, signaling strategies. So what is a signaling strategy uh, and why it is so important? So uh, the lead, what happens is that the leader does not simply execute the action and predicts the other, but it also helps the other by making its, its behavior more predictable. And uh, it does so by modifying kinematic parameters. So in this specific example, if I want to signal you that I'm going to the top part, I can raise my arm much faster and uh, much earlier than when I would have raised it in a normal condition. So in a sense, this, uh, the, the optimal trajectory will be going uh, in this way to the top, whereas if I know that you, you don't know what I will do and you have to, I can raise my arm beforehand. So that, uh, that part of the action, we call it a signal. Uh, here, the, the meaning of signaling is that a signaling action retains its pragmatic effect, so it reaches the top. At the same time, it has an extra effect, which is a communicative effect. So this communicative effect is used to tell you something, such as, okay, I'm going in this direction. We have modeled this, uh, this signaling phenomenon. Uh, actually, we, be, we have built a mathematical theory of this uh, signaling phenomenon. So in a sense here, what you see here, uh, it's not exactly the same task. Uh, there are similar data, they are not real data. Difference. But here uh, you, you see uh, the, the trajectories of, uh, let's say, reaching top or reaching bottom. Again, not real data. And here you can uh, encode this trajectory with an algorithm that gives you also probability distribution. So the, it gives you trajectories, but also probability distribution over the positions here. And uh, by applying this uh, signaling transformation, in a sense, uh, we reason that, that what people do is uh, making the trajectories, the, the trajectory that we do, imagine you are doing this trajectory, changing a little bit by mimic, making it different from this other trajectory. So you see it uh, quickly here. This is the normal trajectory that I would have done when signaling I do this trajectory here. Uh, I don't, don't talk about the mathematics of this, but the point is that you have to be sure that this new trajectory is a valid trajectory because it has to reach here. You cannot do this because it's not kinematically valid. And at the same time, it's very informative for the other because signaling, as I told, includes a communicative intention to the other. So this, is, this, uh, this extra part here is... Uh, is the follower aware that he's signaling to the... Is the leader aware that he's... No, no, that, that, that's a very interesting question. So the point is that a, a lot of these studies on signaling, they have been done in linguistic domains, where typically there are the consideration of meta reasoning or, or knowledge that we are communicating, or knowledge that 
I, uh, I know that you know of my intention of communicating to you, so there are all these considerations. Whereas here, the leader is typically not aware of this. And these are very, very tiny kinematic modifications. And that's also the beauty. So why, why would he uh, do this kind of Yeah, the point, he, the point is that, uh, uh, okay, I tell you my hypothesis in the uh, next slide. But first, uh, just, just to prove that uh, with our system, uh, this is the action recognition system without signaling, and uh, this is the probability of that the right action is recognized. So it is recognized, but here, whereas with the signaling, it is recognized much earlier. So we use the same algorithm as before, but with this new signaling uh, part. So the, this means that the signaling is effective. Uh, okay. What's the, what's the magnitude of that uh, signaling component? Well, uh, we, we are still using, we are st still playing with real data, so at this moment I cannot really tell you, but it's uh, in, uh, in uh, so in the real data it's uh, significant. Well, like it's, it's like, if, in, in, if it's about the bottle example, yes. you talk about a deflection of, let's say, a centimeter and Yeah, very tiny, very tiny. Something like that, the order. Yes, and uh, I, I will try to explain it, to explain you why. Uh, so the point for, for, for us um, is that signaling is part of a strategy for joint action optimization. So this is my answer to your question. So why should you uh, signal? So the point is that signaling is a cost, a biomechanic cost. So you're really trading off the biomechanic cost with... Uh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it seems to be simple, but in terms of this, uh, this trajectory, so if you, if you take uh, an optimal control trajectory, and you deviate from it purpose that's a biomechanical cost could could not be biomechanical could be well anyway it is a cost in terms of the cost function of the, of the system and and uh, it has also a cost in terms of processing because you have to to generate mentally this trajectory which is which is different from this the, the normal trajectory so in, in terms of uh, optimality principles it has a cost in another experiment that I will show you the cost is very high in this case, it's low, but anyway, it has a cost. Uh, at the same time, it, it can be advantageous if considered part of this joint action optimization framework. In a sense, we, we, we don't think that people pay this cost because it is altruistic, <coughs> but because they have this common joint goal to optimize. So uh, this really uh, is, a, is a further step compared to the, the action control theories, because now we have a joint action optimization framework, not a, an individualistic action optimization framework. Again, th this doesn't mean that I'm altruistic, is that we have this common goal of reaching or winning the task or reaching at the same time, and then I pay a tiny cost to really help, not you, well, I help you, but at the same time I really help um, maximizing the success of my goal, which happens to be also your goal, so it's a joint goal. Uh, other people uh, have found that uh, in similar conditions you tend to make your behavior more predictable. Uh, well, what they suggest is, is that to make yourself more predictable, you minimize the variance, which is another way <coughs> to make your behavior more predictable. Yes? I understand the problem with predictable because, in a way, I would, I would think that it's actually less predictable because it's a less natural movement uh, to that particular position. So if I was to do the movement, then I would perform one particular motor plan. And if you theory about simulating uh, another's motion is correct, then you would assume that I would internally simulate the, the natural movement that the other person would do, which is not the case here. So it seems to, to me to indicate that yeah. what's happening here is not that I'm using my own simulation to understand the other section, but because that's actually not working at all in this case, I need to give an explicit signal, which is I move my hand up slightly more than I would normally do and communicate directly through this what my intention is because actually understanding doesn't work in this case through simulation. Well, um, okay, uh, these people that they were mentioning, including Günther, who will be there, I think, in a couple of days, they also reasoned in a similar way. So to make yourself more predictable, what you do is minimizing the variance. This also typically means being slower. In this case, you remain predictable because you do the optimal trajectory, but it's less variance, so it really makes you less predictable. Our interpretation is, is a bit different, and you can see it here. So the point is that you not only you are predicting the action, but you are also discriminating between two hypotheses. By making your behavior different from the second hypothesis, I really help you in the, uh, 
understanding the corrective of the system. So that's the point. So I should have, uh, should have said not only predicting, but understanding. In a sense, that if the space of the hypothesis is set, by making my action very dif di different from the other one. So th th that's the, th the trick that we do. In a sense here, these are the two normal trajectories. And as you can see here, it is confusing. Here, you cannot really understand if it is going here or here. So the trick is really making them, them very different. So th that's our point. At the same time, you can use motor simulation because that, that, that's in the mathematical formulation because these, uh, these changes here, they still remain, remain into the boundaries of, or of a valid action. So you don't do this, typically. You still remain in the boundaries of uh, a valid action. But I completely agree with you that in some cases, you also send what Clark calls uh, coordination signals. So, hey, I'm doing this. Not in this specific uh, task, because it's very quick task, so you, you really want to join. But in some cases, I completely agree with you that you completely switch to another uh, action, which is another action. I will show you uh, in a moment an experiment in which we test this, uh, this hypothesis. Okay, this was just to say that this uh, signaling only, uh, not only exists in these movements, but uh, in many, many other things, for instance, in uh, speech. When we are in a no noisy pub, we over-articulate. When we talk with uh, foreign people, so people talking with me typically over-articulate because they know that I don't understand very much. And, uh, but in noisy pubs, you, it's called, uh, it has a name, it's called the Lombard effect. I discovered it very recently, it's called the Lombard effect. This means that you, in noisy pubs, you over-articulate, also with children. Of course, with children, you have the moderators and these kinds of over-articulations. So you really have your motor programs and, and you also send uh, an extra communicative message. Well, it's not an intentional communication in that I want you to know that I'm communicating. It's just that I help you predicting and making sense of what I'm saying. In noise pubs, that's useful. Uh, also here in uh, fluent finger spelling, finger spelling uh, don't ask me the details of finger spelling. I'm not, absolutely not an expert, but I found this beautiful paper here, Journal of Neuroscience. So they ask it to proficient finger spellers to, to say these two different words, I-S-C-U or I-S-C-A, for instance. And as you can see here, the kinematics are very different, but not only when the A and the U are generated, but even much earlier. The, the, there are two, two different reasons for that, and both happen. One is called the typical co-articulation. This means that you, you cannot uh, generate very strange movements with the fingers. So you, you, you in a sense, you, you, you start a little earlier moving the finger in a certain direction, which will be useful in the future. But in this specific case, this is not the effect. They, they call it dissimulation. Uh, this is why, this is how I got disturbed. So the point is that, um, that depending on the, on the letter that has to be uh, said in the future, you really make your movement different from the preceding letter to help the other get, uh, get a little bit in advance a hint on what the next letter will be. Wait, it can also be a kinematic issue, right? Because if you go there from A to U, you see either you, you, you make a fist or you, uh, the fingers go up. If you go from, well, if you go from C, you might already want to anticipate when the, the, the rest of the hand moves in or out, right? So it has nothing to do with signaling, it has to do with the kinematics of hand movements. Yeah, uh, this is why I said that there are two, two different, uh, they, they talk of two things. One is assimilation and the other is dissimulation. So the assimilation is exactly this, because I cannot really execute strange movements. It's I not strange, it's just uh, from this position I have to do either this yes. or I have to do this. From the C, either the U yes, or right. the A. Okay. So it's, yes. it, 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 you're just biasing already the, the, the movement. Yes, the point is that if I have to say U, with my, with my hand here, I'm already changing the posture a little bit in advance. No, but not to signal to the perceiver anything, just to make it easier for yourself to, to move towards this U position. Yeah, but that would be true, that would be true, if it was not specific against the A. So what they, they, well, I should read, well, probably we should read, but the reason that, the point is that you, you make your, your uh, exactly as we did. So they make this movement not only similar to U, but also different from A. If this was not an A, but was a, a E, then the signal would have been different. 
So that's the signature or signaling, if you want. Uh, you see my alternative interpretation, which is more minimal. No, but uh, uh, no. The, the point is that if you want to make your C, your C similar to your U in absolute, it doesn't matter what is the alternative. Whereas it, if you want to also to signal, it also matters what is the alternative. Okay. That's the discriminating part. Okay, well, I didn't get that from this data. Yeah. Okay. Then th this uh, you have already seen this slide here. So signaling as a cost, we reason that it can be considered part of uh, a, a general strategy for helping the interaction success. But uh, another interesting thing is that this is just one shot interaction. Now things become more complex, more interesting also for uh, for this symposium here. Uh, is that in repeated interaction, signaling can be used also strategically. Can be used strategically, we, we think, for, to form common ground and to share representation with the other. So not only I tell you what is my action now, but I want to share something with you which can be useful for the rest of the interaction, if the interaction is long. So this is a very intuitive picture of why shared representation or common ground are uh, useful as coordination tools. Now let's imagine we are building a tower together, and uh, so uh, I do this, uh, so we have a red and blue, I put this red block here. But if we have different uh, uh, tasks in mind, so I'm thinking uh, we will build this block, this tower here, and you think we, we will build this task here. So we are not aligned. So I will always, with my action, generate big prediction errors in you. Whereas if we share our representation, if we find a way to negotiate, the task, then we save a lot of uh, a lot of time and resources because now we are well connected. We can have very strong priors for what the next action will be, and bo we both can use it. I can use it for generating the action, and you can use it to interpret my action. So shared representation. If we agree on something, and we can continue interaction based on some shared content. Uh, this entails uh, automatically coordinated planning, coordinated prediction, and goal monitoring. So this is why common ground is also so important in language studies. So le this is typically studied in, in linguistics. So when we, uh, when we discuss, we also try to find some common ground. So we don't have to reiterate every time everything, because we know the topic of this conversation. We know a lot about the other. But then uh, there have been a lot of studies in literature for this automatic formation of common ground. Whereas we are now studying signaling as a way to, uh, to, push the com to push the common ground or to share the representation, to align the common grounds. And again, there are considerations so, uh, that this is quite parsimonious because I pay a cost for signaling you something, but uh, in return, I have a big advantage in terms of the rest of the interaction. So to do, to do this, we, uh, we implemented the hierarchical model, but I, I think I will skip it. So the point of the hierarchical model is, is simply that uh, at the bottom it incorporates the action simulation at action observation and simulation that we have seen. But at the top, uh, please just look at this iconically like a picture, I don't explain everything. Uh, it also incorporates, uh, let's call them different plans for action. The plan for building this one or this one on this one. And the plans are sequences of actions. So these two systems simply work uh, in combination because this one provides some priors. Because I, I know what is the plan, I have some priors on what we will do next. Uh, whereas if I see some failure, uh, if I see some big prediction error, then I say, wait, we were not building the tower, we were building another tower. So I can also revise my uh, opinions. And uh, so this is why how it works. So. Uh, the, this guy here observes the other guy putting the red block here. He does the, the motor simulation and recognizes the action which is now passed to the other level. The other level uh, says, okay, this is the most likely uh, plan, the most likely tower that we are building. And then it, it says, okay, if you are building this tower now, I have to do this. I have to put the blue one. And uh, this action is executed and the other one can see it, the blue one. And in this case, this is a confirmation that we are doing correct. It can really confirm that we are now aligned. In this scheme here, what is signaling? Now we go towards more complex things. But anyway, signaling is an action that is done on purpose 
to influence your cognitive variable. So before the signaling was just to help you predicting the, the action that I'm executing right now, but now signaling is the action that tells you what is your, our plan. So action, here signaling is really used for uh, uh, lowering uncertainty on plans and distal goals. So this is really sharing representation, aligning our representation, but this is done on purpose. So in this case, we are really, uh, I can really, on purpose, select the most informative action that I have to do to help you understand what we are doing. So it is not just that I execute my action, but I can really uh, try to change your mind here. Uh, again, signaling is costly, so we should do this only when necessary. Uh, when the coactor is uncertain or wrong. And this is the experiment we did with costly actions. A human experiment in which uh, uh, there is more or less the same situation, this uh, tower building situation that I've shown you before. So here you have uh, the builder, so this is the leader who knows the, the real tower to be built, and this is the helper who doesn't know. But the task is uh, just uh, putting the next block together, that is pressing the same button. And uh, the helper can only see what the, the builder is doing. So can see, can see what he's doing in real time and can select one button to press. And now the, the, the bad thing that we did to our, uh, to our experimental subjects is that now this is the hand of the experimental subject. You can press the blue button or the red button. But now it can do that in two very different ways. It can either pass through the obstacles uh, and then uh, it gets a very good, uh, very kinematically simple action. But from the point of view of the helper, this action is very ambiguous because the helper cannot see, cannot see immediately what the action will be. Or it can go in this direction or in this direction. Now this action is, uh, is really a signaling action, like a coordination signal. Well, I'm doing this or I'm doing that. But it is very costly kinematically. So subjects were a bit annoyed because we, we forced them to do this many, many times. So what we wanted to see is that subjects only signal when this is necessary. When this is necessary, what does it mean? When the, the uncertainty of the other has to be reduced. This is nice because in this way we can really probe is, uh, if uh, interacting people uh, only also keep track of the uncertainty of the other and use this information to decide to send coordination and signaling comments. Uh, okay, and surprisingly, what, what, what we have found is that, uh, yes, people uh, were much less likely to, um, to well, th that's, th that's a big, uh, I have to explain this one. This is the likelihood of the system, so the correct hypothesis. So if this one, the system has already recognized the correct hypothesis. And this is the probability, the blue is the probability that, the, that uh, the, the, the builder does not uh, signal. So in all these cases it signals, here it does not signal. So when the system is quite sure, the system do doesn't signal, doesn't take this cost of signal. So it's point 0.4, right? So you still do signal, but to a lesser extent. Yes, yes, much lesser, yes. And here, this is a different analysis. This is how much your signal would have changed the likelihood of the hypothesis in the next step. It's slightly more complicated. So if the signaling was really discriminative or not. And uh, to make a long, sh uh, long, uh, long story short, uh, what we found is that yes, people is very builders are really uh, they, they are very um, uh, so they are very effective in their signaling because signaling is costly. They maintain a, in a sense a model of the uncertainty of the other and only signal when this is necessary. For instance, if we are building a, a tower made of red blocks, okay, then we start staking red blocks. But I'm the leader. I know that at some point we have to switch to a blue. Of course, you cannot know. So uh, if I continue staking red blocks, you will infer that we have continued staking this. And it is when we have to change, this is a trivial case, but we have, when we have to change a plan, I have to signal. And that's what happens. That's a bit trivial, but also in more complex cases. Please. Just to clarify, uh, were they informed that the long trajectory could be used to signal something? or? They just used it uh, unconsciously. Uh, well, uh, they. So the point is that, yeah, from the long trajectory, 
the observer can immediately see what is the button. So they were aware of this. Okay. They, were, uh, they, they were aware that, that the other guy was observing the actions, and then, it, uh, then, of course, observing this trajectory is much more informative than observing this trajectory, because here, the first part is uh, completely uh, impossible to discriminate. So yes, they were uh, aware of this. And now, uh, this, is, um, this is something that, uh, which I find quite nice, is that uh, le let's, uh, let's go again to this idea of signaling for, for sharing or for changing your mind. Yeah, I think that, that, that that's really the, the root to more complex forms of communication. So, uh, starting again from the, the ideas of this workshop or, or, or our long-term objectives, Really, we want to see how very complex uh, abilities could uh, develop from very simple, si from simpler sensory model abilities. And now we have seen that from uh, single age uh, actions to observation and then to joint action, then to signaling actions. And to me, the signaling actions is, is really the route to more complex linguistic communication. So the point is, it is a motoric form of communication, which I really change your cognitive variables. And I do this in purpose. Uh, I think that. Uh, there are a lot of studies on grounding communication. There are many studies on grounding symbols, many studies on grounding the grammars of communication, but this is grounding the pragmatics of communication. So here, I really get the communicative intention. I have a, pro a, pro a prototypical form of, of a, uh, communicative intention that can be added on to my actions to have some shared context, and this is really the root to me to study communication. Uh, I was lucky that uh, uh, one of the, the big names of uh, linguistics, uh, that is Levinson, really shares this idea. And uh, so the idea is that how do we explain that humans alone master language? And he says there is no stronger universal base in language, like many other people have said, but the strong universal base is the pragmatic foundation that supports language. So the point is that children are really able to Pragmatic to interact with others in pragmatically significant ways, such as, for instance, engage in uh, joint actions, tour taking, and uh, re requesting, but also uh, sending uh, signals to the others. So, they, uh, also prior to language, they are really able to convey communicative intentions, to do requests, to inform, and all of this without language. So, this should be, uh, so, so as he suggests, start studying language from interactions from this kind uh, of interactions in which you really have a, a, a proto-form of communicative intention. Not so proto, that's very effective because we, we, we use this, uh, this signaling uh, every day, really. Uh, there are a few signals that now we are routinized, such as pointing. Pointing is routinized, but most of our actions, they are not only done for doing something in practice, but also for informing the other people of something. Okay, to sum up, what I've shown, uh, I try to offer an action prediction based paradigm for cognition. So I've shown a few examples of how the action system uh, is used to build cognition uh, perception during development, such as these receptive fields uh, and uh, such as these tool use. So you really shape your perception by, uh, with your actions. Uh, you are object recognition, your affordance recognition. So all the knowledge that, that maybe in traditional cognitive science uh, was conceived in terms of symbolic knowledge or, or very abstract knowledge. Well, it can be abstract knowledge, but it has very uh, strong roots into, uh, into the, the basics of our interaction with the world. With, uh, so th there are very important parts uh, of, of the world, such as objects, such as affordances, and now we, we, do not, we do not simply look at this as figures and then we transform them into a, a, an inner language. What we do, uh, actually, is uh, seeing these things in terms of possibilities for action, almost automatically and effortlessly. So the action system really shapes your perception and, uh, and the cognition. And also supports cognitive processing, uh, such as in the example of the climber. But of course, the example of the climber, uh, I like this example, but there are many other examples in which we really th think by generating action possibilities. Uh, think of imagery, for instance, is very famous famous example, but in a sense I, I really like the idea that this embodied problem solving is a simulated action in some sense. This is an idea that is probably, that has to be refined a little bit, because it's not re a real action, it's quite different from a real action. 
but it still has uh, a lot of similarities with real action. So rather than having another symbol system, we can really use the, the, the motor system and the embodied knowledge of the motor system to do a lot of things. And uh, then we focus on social context. We have seen action understanding, joint action, signaling, sharing representation, and the possible route to, to linguistic communication. In a sense, this is, uh, well, of course, I don't have uh, fantastic results yet, but I think that this illustrates a story. The story is how to pass from a, a simple system that acts in the external world and then it reuses this uh, a sensory motor system to do di difficult things, to understand the others, to understand, uh, to try negotiating the environment with the other, to do joint action and then to bootstrap communication. So this is to me, uh, this is why I presented it in this uh, workshop, uh, despite this is more, this is the newest uh, line of research that I have now. But I presented it here because I think this is, uh, it could be maybe an illustration of how we can really uh, draw a line from s the simple uh, sensory motor engagement of our primitive ancestors and the more elaborate cognitive abilities. So the grand challenge, of course, is passing from sensory motor action to more complex cognitive skills, similar to what I've tried to show. Of course, this is not the final argument. But the, I will. I would say and we are more or less um, on the same page. So the same approach without central model for cognition. You start from sensory motor actions and then you, you bootstrap more complex cognitive abilities, including, for instance, uh, signaling, uh, joint action, and communication, but in other domains. So let's look, uh, just to finish, to these other domains. So this is the, more or less the paradigm that I've shown. So the, the paradigm is the sensory motor interaction and prediction that then builds the cognitive processes. Uh, this one could be applied in three different domains that I call environmental structuring, social cognition, and executive functions. So in env environmental structuring, I, well, what does it mean, environmental structuring? So we, we start by just interacting with the world, and then we, we, we do more complex interaction, but then we really change the environment to make it more friendly to us. So we scaffold, we structure our environment to help us. So this is really rising the boundaries of your control. So here you just control your proximal actions, uh, where here you change the world, you build the city, you build Barcelona, and then uh, you can really have much more sophisticated abilities on top of this. So we start from controlling our peripersonal space, and then we really control the world, in a, sense, but in a technical sense. Uh, the same for the social domain, I talk about action understanding, but then joint action, then communication. Well, the, of course, there is no linear, uh, no, no linearity here. It's, they are just examples. But but then we, we we really with communication we start controlling the mind of other people. We really change the mind of other people. So we extend the boundaries of control from our body to the mind of other people. And then with culture we create a system that controls the mind of the society. So really, it's really, again, uh, expanding the boundaries of control. Uh, I think that for executive function, it's more or less the same thing. It's from the control of the body to the control of thought processes, the, to, to cognitive control, what is called cognitive control. So you really use a, a similar mechanism to control yourself and to do, for instance, uh, um, uh, distal actions that require controlling your movements and your body and your actions for a long time. So you, again, you apply this idea of extending the boundaries of your control, uh, but in this case, uh, the control of your action for a discipline, such as I want to become a very famous scientist, so I have to control my, uh, well, not, not, not so successful right now, but uh, anyway, I have to control my actions, my desires, my goal for a long time. So we start by just controlling the proximal action with the affordances that I have, and then we start imagining new ones. Uh, of course, this is a big challenge. I have no, no perfect receipt for this, and uh, if you are lucky, if you are good, uh, there, will be, uh, there will be some interest from the European Commission to study this big challenge in practice. And, uh, okay, that's not so good. Uh, so what is the route to higher cognition? Now this is just uh, the speculations in the conclusions is that uh, the point that I want to defend is that the action architecture of our earlier ancestors gradually extended the boundaries of its control. So from the control of the body to the control of the environment, the environmental scaffold, so to social action and communication, which are controlling another's cognitive variables and then creating cultures that control the, the, the future of our species. And then cognitive control, so the control of our action and the inter, inter 
Um, so in intertemporal coordination of our actions, my action now, my action in two years, my action in ten years, I have to coordinate them if I want to become rich or if I want to become a great scientist. Of course, this corresponds to increasing predictions, and then that, that to me the route to higher cognition. Of course, this is uh, all speculation. Uh, so again, uh, what could be the key, at least for me? So this is just in wild speculation, but uh, as the sensory motor control system gradually evolved, it began to predict increasingly distal consequences of behavior and the prior to action. So you not only have to respond quickly to the environment, uh, but you can prepare in advance. You can really have time to rehearse uh, possible actions into your mind to evaluate, the, to evaluate them in advance. And so you get the full benefits of prediction. You do not only predict the world as it is, but you can predict really the future, the distant future. You can really be prospective. When you can be prospective, you can plan controls, prospective controls. So if I want to buy a car, I have to put my money somewhere. I don't spend my money. So this means that I have to, to, really, uh, to really have big abilities to control my behavior in the present, in the future. And this, to me, is not a different module of cognition. This is just a sophistication of the primitive control systems of, the, of our earlier ancestors. <coughs> Because I'm lucky, so I think that other scientists, such as Shisek in Kalaska, kind of support this idea. Uh, they say also this is consistent with the cross relationship between uh, mental imagery and the system for motor preparation. So if we do this mental imagery or prospection operation, they are similar to the system for motor preparation, but we don't have to, to really execute actions. And uh, they, they are kind to say that this potential explain our organism may go beyond merely reacting to properties of the environment and acting in a goal-directed manner. I would add also control the environment, so create cultures, uh, create uh, uh, big plans for the future, or uh, these kind of things. This simply should be studied in a, in a gradualistic perspective, I think, without adding too many other brain parts. It's just studying, that's not simple, studying how they, they become, become more and more sophisticated over time. And I think that's all. So I want to, to thank the, the projects that are funding me, including the ESMC, for inviting me, and the people who, who work or worked in the past with me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we've got time for questions. Let's we'll start with uh, Hector. Okay, uh, you show us uh, a dynamic Bayesian network model of action understanding. Okay. Yes. Do you have a similar model for signaling? Uh, yes. Uh, well, okay. I haven't shown it, but uh, in, in a sense, the, 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 the graphics I've shown, they are the model of signaling. We, it is just uh, paper in preparation. I didn't give you the details. It's not everything is fixed. But the idea is very, very simple. is that you get this, uh, uh, this uh, these probability distributions for the two different actions, actually they are Gaussian processes uh, that can be extracted from trajectories. And what you do is, uh, is applying a transformation to these distributions that makes the distribution of the action you want to do more dissimilar from the other one, while at the same time a valid one. So it does not go outside the boundaries of a correct action, because you cannot, just for signaling, uh, destroy the kinematics or, or the kinematic parameters. So that's just a mathematical formulation of the signaling action in the simple case. Uh, in the simple case, that I think the beauty of this, uh, of, of, of this system is that you don't need to learn new actions for signaling. Of course, we know there are specialized actions for signaling, such as pointing, but you can also, and that, that's more, more interesting for me, so you know how to slightly change your action in such a way that, that it is informative. And the data on the trajectory that I have shown uh, show that this is effective, that people really uh, catch these, uh, these um, detail, the, these kinematic details uh, very effectively. So we are really well attuned to, to catching these parameters. So yes, we have a formulation. Andreas? Um, it's uh, quite obvious that joint action uh, is used for communicating mental states. My question would be if we move away a bit from the traditional individualistic framework, thinking well, mental state is like in me or in my mm -hmm. brain, whatever, and now I use this to communicate and you have your mental states, but it's an individualistic perspective in the first place. If we move a bit to this, for instance, this extend mind perspective, 
Would you think that joint action can, in literal ways, lead to shared mental states, or using um, Kevin's term, uh, shared raw fields? I'm, I'm thinking about you know mass hysteria in sports events, or yes, say yes. at the stock market. And do you think one could? It, it would be exaggerating to say then it's literally a sort of distributed mental state in a group of people, and not just you know the sum of in individual mental states that are communicated. Yeah, uh, well, that's a hard question. So, uh, in a sense, the, uh, the beauty of this formulation is that you, you don't need uh, one representation for your plans and one meta representation to know what we know, which is more common. It's not your question really, but that's even more common in, uh, let's say, in game theory. So, I know what you know, you know what I know, and, and vice versa. So, it's not only we have two separate mental states, but we have a recursive inference. So it's uh, there are quite famous papers on this uh, also in neuroscience that they postulate that there is a, form, a bounded form of recursive mind reading. So I know your mental states, I know that you know my mental states, and so on, so we have a proliferation. Whereas in this formulation, uh, there are two mental states, uh, let's say, that happen to be aligned, or that can be uh, guided to be aligned. So in a sense, my formulation retains the individualistic perspective without the meta perspective. Uh, uh, having told this, the point is that uh, it's hard to, to, to get away from the metaphors when we talk of this. So in this, in this kind of formulations, you have a plan. The good thing about sharing representation is that so sharing is not something magical to me. It just uh, that these two representations for action uh, happen to be aligned, and that's useful. Even if you don't know that they are aligned, that's very useful because now we are on the same page and we will do the same, the correct things. And in, in the literature, the, there are many, many beautiful studies showing that while we interact, we automatically, without even noticing, align our representations. Uh, you can frame them either in the individualistic perspective by saying that you align two representations, or in the more, uh, let's say, uh, shared or uh, uh, coupled dynamic system perspective. But uh, I, I'm not sure that this will make uh, a very dif a big difference or any difference if we put it into an algorithm. So th that's why it's a bit hard. It could be. All right, all right. Uh, so allow me to ask the Gretchen question, how it's about the scalability of your model? So just in a very practical term, uh, for these towers, how many, what's the dimension of the tower you could build with a reasonable uh, com computational uh, load on your machine? Okay, so, uh, so for scalability issues, you should really ask Hector, who happened to have built a, a, an action understanding system, which, well, the setup is completely different, which is very robust and very scalable. Whereas uh, this system here, uh, it's not a toy, but at the same time, it's not, uh, it's not uh, extremely uh, scalable. Uh, so it, it's not simple to, to answer this question because uh, the kind of inference we are using, they are told to be in principle quite scalable, such as if you use uh, approximate uh, Bayesian inference, such as a particle filtering, that one of the reasons for using this is that it scales. But this scalability means two different things to cognitive scientists and to engineers. So I would not recommend my system to a hardcore engineer. At the same time, I would really recommend the system to, to cognitive scientists to really grasp the, the mechanisms. Because to me, this is a mechanistic interpretation of what happens. So as far as engineering concerns engineering, you, should, you better ask a actor. Whereas uh, for this, this toy problem, uh, it, again, it's not really a toy. It does scale quite well. But for, for uh, more complex things, it's, uh, it's not, not an effective system. Right. Um, uh, I would like to know, uh, in, uh, in your experiment, in your model, when um, the machine is asked like, to predict where the hand is, is supposed to go, uh, you generate hypotheses. Yes. Um, uh, these are uh, prefixed hypotheses, or they can be changed dynamically as soon as the environment changes. For example, adding a fourth object would actually uh, include a, a, a new hypothesis, or uh, it should be like pre-coded in order to do that. Well, uh, in the first system I've shown, uh, we we started the simulation by pre-coding the hypothesis. 
Whereas in the more complete system that I only alluded to, uh, we have two different systems. One system is to getting, uh, so to, to understanding, for instance, the objects of the environment. Uh, then the second system for understanding the actions. And they really interact. Such as if one of the two changes, also the other changes. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, the, so in theory, everything can change when one system detects a, a novel object or generates a new hypothesis, contextual hypothesis, it can really influence the inference of the other. Whereas more, uh, if you talk more of the algorithm, to do this, it's a bit of a trait now. It's, we, we don't have a, but this is not the kind of things that we are really dealing with now. But the question is very correct because we, we continually change the space of our hypothesis. So this is why I think that this uh, actual understanding system should not be a module. Whereas in many, many studies, uh, if you, Paul, if you talk about, again about this resonance term, most of the people that, uh, that conceptualizes these things uh, really uh, would say that it is a model, well, it's completely encapsulated. So you cannot really permeate, it's impermeable to other processes. Whereas I believe that this, uh, this uh, action observation as any other cognitive, many, as almost any other cognitive process is really, can really be permeated by what happens in other parts of the brain. So one is changing the space of the hypothesis, the other is changing the context. So if, if while looking at you, Harry, I remember that now it's Monday, you will, you will have two cups of wine. Then I change my hypothesis on what you are doing right now there. Making sure we move on to the next question. But, um, Kevin. Yeah, so I was, um, didn't completely understand really what you were saying. So I wanted to ask you, to what extent does this kind of approach or to what extent can it be taken further so that the kind of embodied reasoning that you are trying to develop here would go as far as allowing syntactic type computations? So really, you know, your signaling, for example, was uh, uh, essentially a way of decreasing the variance or allowing some other system to decrease its variance. You could understand how one could just get that in a simple extension of the normal computation that the device is doing. But then syntax and planning, for example, or even the notion of goal, doesn't seem to come from that. It seemed to me that you need something more, and that you would never get there using this kind of approach. Uh, OK, well, that, that's a very hard question. So well, the first part of the question is about signaling. Uh, what we want to do to grasp, in a sense, with this kind of theory of signaling uh, that bootstrap communication is is uh, is understanding the, the pragmatic dimension of communication, not the syntactic, for instance. So, uh, but I think that this is a point which has been misunderstood because you don't really ground language by simply referring to the same object in a, in a vacuum. So I, I believe that people, uh, well, children learn language by interacting with people, and have, as we have seen with. Uh, Levinson. So it's really this uh, ability to interact with people, to have meaningful interaction, and to have meaningful pragmatics that really helps. So th th that's the part that I that I want to to take on. Whereas uh, for the other part of the question, so uh, whether or not the system will uh, will explain grammatic aspects or more complex things, really, I uh, uh, unfortunately I cannot really answer. I I personally believe that thi this is a. Uh, uh, these forms of embodied intelligence is really important also for developing any kind of cognitive skill. But that, at this point, this is just speculation, so. And then there's another one, another issue I would like to push on a bit more. Yes. So if you look at the first part of the talk, right, where you, want, you wanted to make an argument that this kind of, let's say, motor cognition, right, would be a generic expression of cognition. And so, but I feel that you haven't really given us any data that, that would make that point. Like, because your examples all have to do with motor tasks, <laughs> right? So think about a pure perceptual task. Like I'm, I'm looking at the world and I have to make decisions now. What, what would be a pure perceptual task? Like the one I just sketched now. Like I'm in a maze, I'm at a decision point. So some 
and I have to solve this, right? So, so how would how would that now be addressed from this pure motor perspective? So I'm the climber, I'm in the maze, so I'm going to make also the movement on <laughs> the side. What I'm going to do it? No, I won't. Right? Actually, I have the answer. I'm not going to tell you. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, uh, I don't believe that there are purely perceptual tasks, but a anyway, the, the example of being a labyrinth and deciding... Yeah, but then you make a definitional issue, that's not my point. Okay, no, no problem. Okay. Show you can generalize. That's not part of my argument, but okay. uh, anyway, my point is that even for perceptual tasks, uh, the action system has two roots of influencing your perceptual task. The first one, you have published the paper on natural on that, so is that the, the action system really changes your perceptual, uh, your perceptual abilities during learning and development. So I don't have to convince you about this. Actually. The second part is that uh, it can also come from a, a computational argument. So I if I'm able to anticipate and, and to do action in these perceptual tasks, or also to predict the consequences of these actions, and to, to get some prediction of what will happen next, and to get some, also some evaluation of what will happen next, that could be very useful also in any kind of perceptual task that they can imagine. So if, I, if for instance, I'm here in this environment, but I'm, I'm thirsty, and then I, I probably look for some refreshing thing. So that's, is that a perceptual task, or is that something which is motivated by my, uh, by my needs and also, and also require that I try out some actions, I evaluate them, and I use this information? My suggestion is that the brain is uh, smart and uses any kind of information it has, including the kind of information it can generate by using the motor system. If this information is uh, poor, it, it will be discarded, because w when it is put uh, with very reliable information, it is discarded. But at least in principle, if the motor system can, has something to, to say, that information will be incorporated in the inference, perceptual inference or uh, whatever. That's my... All right, Andreas, you want to add something to this? You were okay. So uh, then, other questions? Yes. All right, right. Hector. Yes. What you're doing is signaling, actually. You're not solving a purely motor task. Okay, it's part of an epistemic task. You're trying to convey information to Absolutely. the other guys. Yes. So, uh, so the, the, the issue about the use of the motor control. I mean, for solving this task, it does not solve it completely because it's, a, it's not a purely motor task, right? Uh, well, uh, uh, well, uh, I, w I didn't suggest that this is motor. So my suggestion is that in that particular case, you have a motor intention, which is grasping, yeah. or call it as you want, plus a communicative intention, which in this particular case happens to be realized by the same effector. It could also be otherwise. I could reach this and say, uh, I'm reaching this. But so, so my, my point is, is a bit different, is that you, in that case you, are, you have two different intentions, you are using the same effector. But this is interesting because you, you can really modulate your behavior, not only for your pragmatic reasons, also for epistemic and communicative reasons. And that's nice because it's, uh, I think uh, it's a new field. And, uh, but it's at the same time, it's something that we do, we do all the time. Not only at this small scale, but also at, at a big scale. So we, we buy expensive clothes, we do, we do many things to, uh, let's say, to signal to the others. Uh, signaling is, re is really crucial in animal communication, in, uh, but also in human communication. So well, I don't want to go in this direction, but uh, a lot of marketing, a lot of uh, yeah. what we do is signaling. Signaling is planning with a physical environment. Yes, it's very different for the multi-agent planning, where there are two agents, okay, because all these issues come up and many other. Well, so there are many, many issues there. Absolutely. When you go from one agent to, to two. Yeah, we start from two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that note, thanks everybody. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, Marcello.